This video is brought to you by Diamond Pacific Tool Corporation. Diamond Pacific is America's favorite diamond tool, wheel, and lapidary machine manufacturers. For nearly half a century, Diamond Pacific has set the industry standard for diamond lapidary equipment. Join the majority of professional lapidaries and choose Diamond Pacific products such as their Nova Wheels, Pixie, Genie, and Titan Gem Makers, as well as their wide selection of other high-quality lapidary diamond products. Check out Diamond Pacific today and find out why they're considered America's premier diamond lapidary tool manufacturers. Here again, folks. Tucson Convention Center. The original Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Everything else is kind of just venues that popped up over the last 50 something years around this event. I love being here, but at the same time it's kind of sad because it means the show's coming to an end. This particular show is four days long. This is the first day, Thursday. People are still setting up. Well, but we already see some big players. This guy down here, that's a big turquoise guy right there with the buckskin shoulders. You can see uh, me in his sh turquoise shop in Santa Fe on our um, uh, Indian Market 100th anniversary video. But it's a lot of fun, a little bit of money. I think it's $13, parking's like 10 bucks. I just got dropped off. It's gonna be great. Hopefully we see some friendly faces, to take a look at some stuff that we wouldn't see at other venues. And um, I'm pretty sure around noon, we're going to be talking to somebody that you folks probably, probably recognize. Later today and throughout the weekend, this is going to be packed. No walking room. It's kind of nice to be here first thing Thursday morning. Before we get started, I want to remem remind you folks that... Um, Make sure to subscribe to the channel. It says only 30% of you folks are subscribed that watch, uh, which is actually way above average for YouTubers. I have a small channel, but compared to other people, 30% is pretty rock, and I think some of the big wigs only have about 11%. So thank you if you have subscribed. Make sure to like the videos. If you haven't done so already, it really does help. And uh, yeah, if you haven't done so already, go ahead and subscribe, like, and share it on your favorite social media platforms. Um, if you think your friends and family might like my style of videos. It might not be for everybody, but it might be for a lot of you folks. I do expect to get yelled at in here a few times, but, yeah, especially by the mineral specimen people. They don't like people filming their stuff. Many reasons for that. Let's do it. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? So, all the booths are between here? Here with John Cook and the world famous Justin. How you doing, bring, brother? Good, thanks. How are you? <laughs> doing great. You having fun? Absolutely. Absolutely. You were at the GJX before here? Yeah. And now you're here, uh, booth 23 and 24 at the Crystal Ballroom. You'll be here till Sunday, I believe? Yep. Oh, yep. fantastic. Great. And then where do you head to? I'm. Oh, you're not going to Denver? No, we're going back to my boat. <laughs> and my fishing rod <laughs> and my son, <laughs> we're gonna go fishing. Well you deserve deserved, it. Huh? Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. I can imagine me setting this up and then taking it down and setting it up and taking it down. I mean, that's gotta be a lot of work. Oh, yeah, it is a lot of work, but um, I have a, I try to have a, quite a balanced life of play and work. So. Good. Um, it's not, life's not all about work. Uh, that's important. Yeah, that's do you don't take I, a little time for yourself? I do what I love because it doesn't feel like work. <laughs> it's my zen when I'm cutting, you know, and then my wife's always like, well, you need to come do something with the family, do this, and I'm like, well, this is me kind of clearing my mind. She's like, no, you got to come in that. <laughs> so for those of you that don't know Justin T, he's the 
main man behind Black Opal Direct, probably one of the most influential YouTube channels um, on Opal and Lapidary in general. Keep going, keep going. Something, <laughs> something very special about Justin is, in a world of trade secrets, it really seems like you're more than willing to share yeah. your technique. Yeah. And so you, you tell people exactly what you're paying for rough and then what it's worth at the end. There's this transparency where a lot of people don't want a lot of people to know that because they're making money off of what, they, what the purchaser doesn't know. Um, you're a huge service to the community and to the art form and to everyone in Opal and not just Opal. You're setting a really good example for this honesty that people can have in the industry that a lot do not. And I want to thank you, brother. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. That's very cool. So you're a very busy man. Um, a lot of people are here to see you. Do you mind if I ask you, can we see your favorite piece that's here at the moment? Absolutely. Look, his son knows where to go. So this piece is not only the best piece of opal I've ever found or seen in my life. Um, it was underneath the house or the shed that my dad lived in, in Lightning Ridge, back in the 60s. Oh my goodness, like it, it wasn't, it was like dug there? Yeah. Oh, wow. So he was sleeping on it the whole time. And we've never, in 50 years, we've never seen a stone quite like that. And unlike gold and other minerals, where it's a little more of a telltale sign of where you can find it, the opal is just Honestly, it's just a hit or miss. I mean... Yeah, it, it's very hard to judge the ground underground. You've got fault lines and blows and all sorts of things that can give you indicators. Um, but there's a bearing, an opal bearing level that's usually clay or sandstone, and um, that that level can look really beautiful, but still have no opal in it. Yeah, and I, I see people are doing um, test holes, you know, yeah. and I'm imagining that you could be sitting next to a huge honey hole, but then drill right to the left of it, say there's nothing to it, and then turn around and drive up the street and do another Ladies hole. And gentlemen, so, may I have your attention, so that's the best. That's the best, the best way to find us. So, personally, I mean, yes, that's absolutely gorgeous. My personal favorite pattern and color is the one that's sitting right there. Which one? This one? Yes, sir. Just has a little bit of everything in it. This is in a row. Huh? This was in one of my lives. Are 220. Two, two, um, zero. Do you have any episodes of you cutting this one and the one from underneath your father's? Uh, no, not the other one. But this one I do. Yes. The other one I actually didn't cut. The actual, the actual opal liner cut that one. Oh wow! And so I take it that one's not for sale. Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, only for four hundred thousand. Yeah. That's actually the show special today. <laughs> Um, so a lot of artists and a lot of cutters, a lot of collectors, well, a lot of specimen dealers, they don't have private collections. Everything is for sale. Um, do you have a private collection at home? Fantastic. A lot of people don't. Everything's like everything's for sale. We're going to bring everything. And when one day you retire and you don't have anything, and now you're having to buy back the stuff you cut. Have you been collecting as long as you've been cutting? Sorry? Have you been collecting as long as you've been cutting? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yes. And uh, are you cutting now? Um, I've started very, very recently, um, but yeah, slowly getting into it. I'm, I plan to do a lot more in the next year with Dad. Oh, fantastic. It's such a valuable skill for him to pass down to me. But um, yeah, definitely going to start getting into it a bit more. And well, then be able to claim the title of uh, third generation black opal cutter. I mean, that's huge. Yeah, that's you know? I mean, if you weren't going to take the position, I know someone would want to be right behind just to take it. <laughs> the only difference is the cutting level will go down like this. No, no. <laughs> no. Dad's dad was one of the best cutters there was. Dad's an incredible cutter himself, and I just like the reality Stop of it is. Himself down. No. But like anything, so when you when your dad started teaching you, how good were you? Um, like a toddler. Yeah, that was, that was pretty crap. So I mean, it's all about experience. Right? The reality is, In, um, though, he's been out and see every single field with, with like every single pattern that comes out of those fields and he's, he knows though like he can pick up pretty much any stone and tell you what field it come from 
time. And that's something that I probably won't get the experience of you just because will. there's not enough opal coming out of the ground anymore from those fields. And yeah, to close some of the fields out. or not, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, some, yeah. not necessarily closed, but mined out. Mine. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. So different fields cut different ways, and Dad's Dad now knows that, and that's something that something really that's really to hard to pass on. Yeah. yeah. Because unless you've experienced all of those those areas right. and what comes out and how it cuts, right. you won't know. Right. So, yeah, that's a that's something that will probably die with me because you can't. And that was what was important for me to come out to the show and see all the different, uh, you know, opals that people have. Is that, that, you know, watching Justin's videos and seeing pictures only teaches you so much. Until you actually touch it, till you cut it, till you look at it, you really don't really grasp the full magnitude. And I'm, I know I'm still not even touching the surface, but just as much, you know, education I can teach myself. And he's been phenomenal. I mean, I'd say most of my skills have been I learned from this channel. scratching the side of my head. <laughs> um, if you don't mind me asking, I was asking your father he, about his private collection. Do you have a private collection for yourself no, no, yet? No, not at all. And when, and when you cut, are you using your father's equipment? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, that's nice of him to let you. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. It I'll is. start renting it soon. I've got. <laughs> awesome. I've got access to the best equipment that I could probably possibly get my hands on. and that's always going to have rough for me to practice on like I've got all the all the tools I just need to take advantage of it I think that's that's where it really but yeah. yeah, he's got old gem masters and stuff like that. He actually has to kickstart it with his hand when he presses uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've so, never seen him do it, but he's like taking it to spin and kick it on. So you're developing a light? Yes. Um, and it's this is the second version coming out soon, I heard, perhaps? Yes, we, um, we've got the prototype done, so we know exactly what it's going to do and look like. And it's called the called the Gemfish IF1, so it's the Inclusion Finder 1, okay? I like to say it's internally flawless, but <laughs> that's just me. And um, yeah, so we're, we're about to go into production for March, so they'll be available in March. And um, they have two settings, it's one's um, low, and it's got a very we worked on that low setting for very small stones because if you have a light that's too bright and you shine it into it, the inclusions disappear because the light is too bright. Um, so you need you need it to be a little bit more subdued for those smaller pieces. And then you've got the, the higher setting, which we will get into most gemstones. And um, also has a USB-C charger. So they all the Chinese models that you have to unscrew them and take the, the battery out, put the charger by, in. by a separate charger for them. Yeah. And they overheat too. These things get really hot if you leave them on. So this one has a momentary switch that turns on and off and it'll last you forever. If you keep the button on, if you keep it on for 20 minutes and it still doesn't heat up the nozzle. And the reason why it doesn't heat up the nozzle is it's got a very special little magnified lens in there that that enhances the um, color right through the the lens and um, it doesn't need as much light to protrude straight out so it's a very cool little design Amazing. and it's water resistant we can get it tested so to be waterproof but it has <clears throat> pardon me it has seals on every single junction so that it will um, you can you can dunk it under water and it'll be fine and um, obviously it's useful for more than just opals. Um, yeah, absolutely. You can use it on any gem that you're looking for inclusion. So yeah, it's not just for opal. Fantastic. Yeah. And, to, and to his point, I mean, prime example, we'll show you who makes it, but like this one tends to overheat. It'll literally get so hot it'll burn you. Yep. And then these batteries I had to buy and they're special because there is no chargeable batteries. Yeah. And I've been looking for a replacement forever, but this is the best I can get with such a small thing. But um, I actually burnt one up and had to send it back because it almost burnt my hand. Mm -hmm. And so once he told me that, I've been asking him for like a year now, when are you going to have them? When are you going to have them? So I'm excited to get one of my hands You'll on one. Notice the hole um, where the light comes out of is much smaller than that torch. Oh, so look, look so at the you don't you don't get yeah you don't get the um, the glare out the sides of it. Because right. it's so much smaller, you can really pinpoint the light into the gemstone. 
Yeah, that's that's huge because I'm doing this all the time, trying to put my fingers on. There you go, exactly. And also that one's got a dial which you yes. can turn and you have to leave it on when you pick it up and put it down. Yep. Every time you put this down, it turns off. Oh, and nice. And every time you pick it up, you press the button and it turns on. That's an awesome right, feature. So, so you're saving your battery. Yeah. And in the last few weeks, I have not flattened the battery yet. Really? Oh, oh man, I've I can't accidentally let this even just slightly on before the light comes on and then an hour later, the batteries are dead. Yeah, right. You know, and so not been really, really happy with it. Well, supposedly there's on high, there's a five hour battery life, but I've never been able to hold my finger on for five hours. <laughs> oh, <you're right. laughs> I kind of get uh, distracted. Very nice. <laughs> oh, nice colors. <laughs> so, um, do you mind before I get going, can I see perhaps one more of one of your favorites? Say my favorite that we've got. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what about me? <laughs> He's got great taste. So I probably like a bit different stones to dad, but I'm absolutely obsessed with this stone here. It's got script pattern in it, and it's got just my favorite colors, the blues and greens, and then it's got a little bit of yellow on top to just top it all off. But yeah, my favorite stone, bit of a higher dome. How much is it? Um, I think this has 25 on it. 25 cents? 25 grand. 25 grand? Yeah. Fantastic. That's Jack. Sounds good. Yeah, <laughs> seven and a half carats and 25 grand. Oh, a magnificent stone, that. Yeah. Beautiful high dome. Lots of different patterns. How many patterns are there that folks are coining nowadays? Oh, that's the sky's the limit. <laughs> so um, many. You can, you can become really creative if you Dad want to. Dad makes one up every week. Oh, wow. <laughs> No, I don't. No. <laughs> so, so many people call their opal pattern harlequin, and they, if it's got any colour in it whatsoever, they're going to call it harlequin. And the reason they do that is to try and make a sale. But harlequin really is like the yeti. You know, mm. it, do, it doesn't really exist, but it can. Right, yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, there is there is the very odd occasion where you find a stone that has pure checkerboard pattern. And um, that's what a harlequin is. And if it's not a pure squared checkerboard pattern, it's flagstone. It's not harlequin. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. You got good taste uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he produces the the guides for even you know care for the opals and everything he does is top top notch. Oh, the green. So you basically set the stone on it, then you move it up and down to, to judge the body tone. Yeah, then you bring the it color. down and adjust it to see the brightness of the color. A lot of people I see online are always like, oh, I got a, you know, a B5, which is the brightest stone you can get. And then in reality, it's more like a B3. So for instance, if we get a, a nice opal, we see down here, you can see it's much darker than these body tones here. And never turn the stone over to try and gauge the body tone because it will it can look very different on the top so if we slide it up the scale until we get to kind of where we think the body tone is and we're getting a little bit far it's probably sitting around let's say there that's an n4 which means it's a black eye so the scale's really handy to do your grading now, if I'm right though, that oval right there, that would be the galaxy pattern? That's a stereo. A stereo. A stereo. So when you've, got a, when you've got a pattern that is coming from a nuclei in the middle, see that nuclei? Right in the center. And all the patterns, like starburst, they could call it as well. I call that a, st a stereo pattern. Gotcha. And it, is that one you cut on the live also? Uh, I just remember you saying, I think this is a stereo. I can't remember if I did or not. You've got a lot of videos. <laughs> <laughs> can't remember. Yeah. There you go. That's a stereo. That was in a video, that one. Oh. You should see how excited he gets when, especially he can't tell. He just knows the outside of kind of what it looks like. And there's times where he's beaten, you know, by sand on the video. And you can see the disappointment in his face. But when he hits that top gem and he takes it down and takes the risk to take that one color bar off to get to the next one. You know, I can see it, it's definitely a reward, but it's like, yes, it worked out. And, but it doesn't always work out. It's, you know. Mr. Thomas, I can't thank you enough for your time, brother. Pleasure. It's pleasure. an honor and a pleasure. pleasure I can't wait you. to see what you're crunking out here soon. Oh. <laughs>
And the light will obviously be available on your website when that's available. Yes, when that's correct. available. And um, folks that are interested in rough parcels, beginner parcels, cut stones, all of that's also on your website as well. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, booth 23 and 24 here at the ballroom. He even brought some uh, some parcels for folks to buy, so come see him and get them. A few of them right there. Heck yeah. Getting into cutting, this is a perfect little way to introduce yourself. $100 bag of rough. It's got a bit of color in it. Yeah, it's a good way to learn. Awesome. Thank you, brother. No worries. See you guys soon. Take care. Red Earth Opal. White Cliffs, Australia since 1992. Beautiful pineapple. Here's some jars. Are they for sale? They are for sale. Hey there, brother. Hey, go. Could you tell the folks at home a little bit about the pineapples? Oh, well, I mean, we got some better ones over here in the cabinet. <laughs> oh, I'd love to see them. <laughs> I mean, if you got to look, you want to look at these. So these are, uh, these are actually like a very rare and unique mineral specimen from Australia, the opal pineapple. And we're looking at a, um, an Ica-Ite crystal that we believe grew around 120 million years ago under ice. So it was a frozen cold water conditions for the precursor mineral to grow. Uh, later it calcifies into the blender night and where I live it is then later replaced with opal. So it's very rare and unique. Um, very few of them survived the early mining back in the 1890s um, and so there's not very many of this sort of quality left in the, in the world basically. So are most pine uh, opal pineapples in Australia fine in White Cliffs? All opal pineapples oh, all them. are found in White Cliffs. It is singly the only place in the world. Fantastic. So I imagine the double or the triple is just incredibly more rare than the single? Yeah, absolutely. So what you're looking at, that top shelf, uh, you're looking at the best of the best of the best. What a so, stunning. Um, what an honor and a pleasure. One of the fine collection just there and, you know, alone. Is it considered a pseudomorph? It's a double pseudomorph, technically, uh, as it's actually changed twice. And we're looking also at the fossil of the mineral, the original mineral. That is amazing. Um, so I see that a few of them are for sale. Can folks at home find you on your website? Uh, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, we do, we do a lot of online um, uh, trade as well. Obviously, everything is for sale. We have pieces really from just a few thousand up to, you know, the absolutely high top end, you know. So uh, great, great acquisition for any mineral collection. Uh, and the fact also the mine is now finished as far as with the mining goes, um, there's no more of this quality going to come out of the ground. Oh wow, so Basically. what's out is what's it. That's it. And I was looking at some of your jars and stuff, could folks contact you for some of those jars? Yeah, or? we sell we sell our rough, um, we sell rough opal, we sell cut stones, we sell uh, specimens. Occasionally we've got fossils, little bivalve shells and gastropods. Um, so yeah, we have a bit of a range. Anything opal that comes from Wycliffe's, we've got it. Um, so I see that this one looks like it's been polished a little bit. Is that something common? They're more valuable as a crystal than they are if they're cut it. Well, what, was, what happened with this particular one was, uh, I mean, there, there it sits just there. Um, but when it came out of the ground, most of these will fall apart and break, you know, so it's hard to get ones that are intact. So the actual bottom section stayed in, in the ground. It was still part, like, mostly calcite. Um, so I then just ground this back to, to expose then a lot more of the opal colours that's, that's in that one, just to face it off a bit. What's the difference between calcite and patch? Two different minerals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah completely. So, so we're looking with the, with the pineapple, ica -ite to calcite to opal. Some of, the, some of these, like this one here, the calcite didn't fully dissolve out when the opal come and was replacing, whereas others can be just full solid 
opal or potch, you know, right through. But we have sort of pieces from, you know, from the bottom to the top end. If you don't mind me asking, so I hear that some people used to cut the shells as a cutting rough. And so they would um, kind of treat it more like rough than a fossil. Was that ever the case for the pineapples? So back in the 1890s, when they first found them, uh, pretty much everything that was found was cut up. Oh, wow. That is why there's so few of these left today, uh, because the during the, the bulk peak period of mining, um, they're all destroyed. So, oh, wow. so that's why we just don't have very many today. Um, can I trouble you for your booth number? Uh, number two in the crystal ballroom. Number two in the crystal ballroom, Red Earth Opal. If you folks at home can't make it, make sure to check them out online. Fantastic stuff, world-class stuff. And uh, come see the best of the best if you're here in Tucson, Arizona. Absolutely stunning. You gonna take home a pineapple? Maybe. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? Good, good. So those are the names of the three pieces over there. Heart of Australia, the Devil's Marbles, and the Three Sisters. Absolutely amazing. Well, here's a QR code if it helps anybody at home. You bought it? Sure. Do you mind if we share it with folks? Yeah. John Cook can't help himself. Can't. He's got great taste and he's not afraid of it. That's wow, that's affordable. That's a fantastic. That place. is very affordable. Great for inlay and mosaics. It's going to be phenomenal. And uh, John Cook's not afraid to cut small stones. Not at all. You got good taste, John. Yeah, that's what my mom always says. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Can't wait to see what you do with those. I know you're going to do something great. Great buy, brother. Booth 43 and 44 here in the Crystal Ballroom. True blue opals and gems. Come visit Sally, the director here. Looks like they got a Tucson number. Very cool. Right here. As you move it, you'll see the surface. Giant, beautiful minibee. Yeah, this is spectacular stone. It's two carats. And it's $800. I bought a bunch of these. Black opal from Lightning Ridge, Australia, which is in the very center of this country. Some of the best boulders I've ever seen at the show. I've got to do it on the five dollars. I can give somebody the graphics. Yeah, it's totally true. Very much worth it. Very easy. There's a nice Yawa nut. It's already sliced but not opened. Here's a perfect Yawa nut sliced. Amazing. Wow. Oh, wow. Now it makes sense as to why you have such a beautiful collection of, of nice stuff. Really nice stuff. Yeah.
Amazing piece of Anamukas back there. These guys were, you know, they used our microscope to try to see exactly what they got some really nice pineapples. Well, yeah, because you've seen it over and over and you can read it, you know? Um, yeah, and, and I've, I've only done a little bit of boulder, so obviously I've got so a ton of learning to do. But, um, you know, I bought more and so I'm cutting more, but uh, i got to learn how to read it. Yeah, that's the main part of this, otherwise you can make a big loss. Well, and that in videos, uh, other people reading the stone only does so good until you grab it and try to do it yourself and then cut it and go, no, I was wrong, you know? So. You ready, my brother? Yeah. Sally, I can't take you enough. Okay. These are so affordable. That's being cut. That piece. Oh, wow. See how big it is? It's huge. That's like the we, size we piece I'm about to buy. Yeah. That's fantastic. I don't have a saw that big. Huh? <laughs> I can figure out how I'm going to cut it. Look at that, how big that was. Amazing. See that piece? How, the size of the hands and all that? Oh, wow. Did it's got to be 70, 80 pounds, huh? No. And then you got the one side. And then that's the other side. That was the other piece. That was awesome. But even that was so big. Look. Jeez Louise. Oh, wow. So, so you're actually watching it. For the size, like, you know. So that's the big saw. There. So it's gone halfway. Oh, wow. That is so amazing. If you want to circle around, we can. That'd be awesome. What is Harry? Uh, a spider trapped in the amber. So. <laughs> oh my. Is he Dominican? Do we know where Harry is from? I, we do. I don't know it off the top of my head. I don't know. <laughs> I know had it. From a long time ago, that's my answer right now. <laughs> hey guys, do you you license? License? Yeah, stick your license? And then this, something red. It's a lab-grown ruby. A ruby. I'm trying. It's impossible. People at home like keep it still. Oh, yeah. It's impossible. <laughs> oh man! Oh well. The music's great. Too fast. Music too loud. Too good. Yeah, I'm moving slow motion. <laughs> My favorite ones when they're like, you should just give Sprite your YouTube channel, but or when they call him Spike. Spike. Where's Spike? Amazing. And you contour carved it. Do you use a wheel to get the curves or do you use a handpiece? Everything. Oh, wow. <laughs> Whatever it takes. I, I, I believe all tools are sacred. <laughs> Absolutely. And your bail is awesome too. Did you make your bail? I designed them and I have uh, people that cast my silver jewelry uh, cast those for me. Fantastic. Yeah. All the brains, none of the brawn. Yeah, and I don't have to make them every time. It's like very good. That's a great price for this as well. So actually, will shine. <laughs> for these fantastic jars, are they lathed or? Um, the, these? Yeah, because they're so perfect. 
Yeah, they're, well, they're, they're lathe if they are um, the softer material. So um, like the mammoth they, ivory? These are carved by hand. Wow. So they look like they're lathe, but I spin them and have to mark them as they're spinning. And then I take them off and hand grind them, sand it a little more while it's spinning, mark it again, take it off until it gets really round. Then I can work it while it's spinning. Because it's not a lathe, it's an arbor. Are you Steve Stiegel? I am. Oh, that's fantastic. And I'm not Steven Seagal. No. <laughs> I don't like him. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people he blows, don't. He blows, he blows up oil platforms in Alaska. Oh, in yeah. Movies. It's like, yeah, we want to do that. You're right. Look at I that guy. Everything. Willie the walrus right there. The beetle like, nut ones are cool, too. Yeah, this is walrus, 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 walrus. walrus. And he does Man. it inlay, too. The dogs. Stunning. How long have you been working uh, the ivories? 50 years. Oh, wow. Do you know spring chicken at this? No. That is amazing. Like Whoa. Well. <laughs> I'm still alive and I'm still standing. Are you in Alaska still to this day? Yeah, I, we lived in Alaska for a little while. I had a gallery up there for 12 years in Skagway. But I've never really, really lived up there. I've always been from where I'm at right now. Oh wow! Um, in Oregon, the um, the northwestern native cultures do they use ivories as well? Or maybe on a random, you know, not much. Though. I guess it would be more whales than maybe. I don't know. And so, with the ivories, would it be a lot of the same tools that you would use for woods? And your final polishes, would they be... Um, mm -hmm. Interesting. And is it a, like a, is it different than stone? So opposed to like a cerium oxide or a aluminum oxide, you'd use like triply or um, wax-based? Yeah, Zam. Zam, really, Zam. That's and this is all natural polish, just no lacquer or anything. Oh, wow. So these are polished with Zam. That is impressive. But that's after, you know, all the oh, way yeah. 600 grit. Yes, sir. You know, go to 600, then polish. That is so impressive. Zam's mostly made for metals, and I'm a turquoise guy, so I use a lot of Zam for turquoise. Oh, but I would have imagined... Um, it's I got a little wax in it, so it really gives a nice shine. So what do you think of these? I'm, getting, I'm thinking about buying these. Stunning. What are they? Chrysocolla from Baghdad, Arizona. Are they stabilized? It looks like they are. So what I was going to say is I have no problem with stabilized. No. Maybe. And when it comes to Chrysocolla, I need it to be. Yeah. <laughs> so I think those are absolutely fantastic. They almost look like old Arizona. And it's probably a fraction Nin of the price. Ni 1955 was when they last mined this stuff. Oh, wow. So it is vintage. Oh, yeah, Baghdad, Arizona. Oh, my God. Oh, Baghdad. I'm thinking of... You're, oh, you're thinking of Baghdad. <laughs> yeah, now. sorry. No, no. Baghdad. No, I, Baghdad. I love them. And the fact that they're stabilized, and since you're a fine worker, it's going to be able to take your... Um... I mean, look at the bubbles in that. Oh, that is amazing. Sweet. The Matrix is a little odd, but, you know, I think... I, I want to do a vessel on them. I cannot wait. Work. Do you ever post anything that you make new on your website? Some... Please, when you make those, post them on your website. I'll, okay. ch I'll check every month until I see it on there. I would love to I'll see that. It. You're fantastic, brother. And um, if you don't mind me asking, are the asymmetrical vases easier to less work than the symmetrical ones? No, they're more because when they're asymmetrical, I'm carving all the finish. So all I'm turning is the inside. The lip and the, and the bottom are turned and the rest of it is hand carved. Oh, amazing. And would it be something similar to like a wood lathe? Or is it a mill? Yeah, no, it's a little, it's a little carpet tech. Is, is it a fox or is it a... Carpet tech. Oh, cool. That's a good one. I don't even know <laughs> if they make them anymore. I doubt it. You know, they... Uh, I, I bought it 30 years ago. So my friend sent me a picture of this bag here. My grandfather loves to carve uh, walrus and... Yeah, and... Uh, we're always looking out for delamination, and for a hundred bucks, uh, this is a screaming deal. Yeah. That one piece right there 
if you're an artist, that's worth a hundred bucks right there. <laughs> Interesting. Is it just because of ignorance and it gets confused for... Well, it's ignorance. Yeah. And our politicians, you know, pass laws. Six states now have made it all the ivory illegal because this this radical uh, lobbying group lies to our, you know, our, con you know, whatever politicians they, they make they, these decisions <laughs> and they say, oh, this big mammoth ivory market, they sell a lot of... Uh, um, smuggled elephant ivory carvings that have been dyed a little bit to look mm -hmm. like mammoths. Or amongst the tusks, supposedly. And they probably think you're going up to these walruses and ripping the tusks right out of their face or something. <laughs> no, they're, they're abundant and and uh, they're fossilized. You wouldn't probably wouldn't want to use a raw one. Well, yeah. I mean, it's white. It's not really exciting. I love the colors. That's why I got it. Fantastic. So it looks like you're not afraid of nice quality burl woods. Every kind of wood on earth. Probably in the booth there is probably 75 to 100 different woods. Oh, wow. Um, do you ever stabilize your wood, Steve? Do you use cactus juice? Cactus juice is a brand of wood stabilizer that a lot of people um, use for... Paleo Bond is what it is. Paleo Bond. That's good stuff. Quite pricey. But it's worth it. It's quality for sure. These are great. So these are these have the elk buttons attached to them. Looks like, or maybe that's where the buttons detached. No, I can't help it. This is so beautiful. It's delicate looking, but it's probably very sturdy. I have a big time love for ivory carving. My grandfather's an ivory carver, and Ruben Medina's been doing it. For not as long as Steve here, but it's pretty good, and they actually have a similar style. It's such an honor to uh, take a look at Steve's stuff. They're really high quality. And it uh, looks like he's not afraid to work other materials, too. Is that a pronghorn? What is that? Is it, it seems super thin. I don't know if it's not a pronghorn. But uh, it's a really thin and delicate piece of ivory. Maybe it just works down. I don't know, that's, that's intense. It's definitely not, uh, it's definitely fossilized now that I'm looking at it. Not afraid to work the jade. It's got some gold and some facets for the eyes. Let's get going. Do you know where it is? Right over there. Awesome. So make sure to check out Steve Stiegel and June Harper stuff online. Absolutely stunning material. Absolutely stunning craftsmanship. Super high quality. They are booth 18 in the Crystal Ballroom. Definitely worth taking a look at. Some really awesome longer facets. This piece here, are those um, cubic diamonds, right? In the middle. Some really thick heishis. At a certain thickness, is it even a heishi anymore?
What an interesting abalone bangle. Gonna be trippy. I love the use of the square diamonds. Rough. And this one has these uh, the diamonds on the side, and it's strung with diamonds. I love raw diamonds a lot more than some facets. Sorry. Something really simple about their style here, but um, definitely super elegant. Condor agate mines. Um, this gentleman used to be married to Mrs. De Los Santos. Him, her, Eugene Mueller, three of the best polishers and agates in the entire industry. The secret is, it's that it's no secret. It's a Richardson Ranch polisher, three different grits. Nobody has a better polish than this guy here at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Impeccable. Uh, it was, it was 70, I like what you just said. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I'm listening. Oh, he's, right. not, he's not, he's not, he's not joking 60. around. He uses them. Oh, yeah. um, Thank you. The Very gentleman uh, told me nice. that um, straight from the saw, 100 grit silicon carbide, no water, Richardson Ranch, spinning 3,500 RPM. From there, a worn out 220, straight to cerium oxide. Wow, Fast. from this, 220. From 220, worn wow. out. And the secret is that silicon carbide breaks down into a finer mesh where diamond won't break down. And so the 220 is probably working more like a, like a thousand grip. The speed lets you jump through steps where like if you used a diamond grinder, you would have to go, you know, 80, 220, 280, 612, yeah, 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 2000. Yeah, yeah. You usually go for... And um, the secret is the speed, it's the heat. And then cerium oxide can actually, um, from like 600 grit, a normal person could actually get away with a mirror polish, even if you missed a bit on 220. But this gentleman here, it, the secret is that there's no secret. He'll tell you how to do it, but it's the touch. It's, it's yeah, there's it's the experience. Almost no it. pressure at all. This, you're the man, man. I missed you at the courtside show. Some of the, I know, I didn't have time to, to come say hi to you. Oh, you're inside, right? I love telling, I love telling people how great your polish is and that your secret's no secret. You'll tell them how to do it and they're still not going to get it done. Richardson Ranch, straight from the saw, 100 grit, silicon carbide, worn out 220, cerium oxide. Something like this, maybe four minutes. <laughs> but... Very simple sounding. The touch is the technique. You're amazing, dude. I think the material, the, the supplies are the secret. How good is your serum oxide? I think that's the, the key. Have you used a lot of inferior serum oxides? I only use optical gray. So it's expensive, but the abrasion power, power is amazing. That proof is in the pudding, folks. He's one of the best ever. Thank you. Extremely affordable. Yes, sir. Like a look. I've known Anna for the last eight years. Uh huh. Coming here. So. Yeah. Yeah. So you took what almost looked like looking from back imperfections is actually finger right. smudges yes. and dust. No, They're the absolutely best. perfect. Let's take a look at some of the, when we think of real deal stuff. These are craters, crater agates. Again, all that stuff that looks like imperfection, that's finger smudges from people touching that polish. Incredible, the crater agate is stunning. The condor is great. Black River, is this what they call island agate? Is it something different? Some people don't like to say where island agate is from. What I mean by that is Highland Park isn't telling people where it's from. 
Exclusivity is something very unique and powerful in the industry. Label? Yes, please. A lot of people think of these crater agates as the Argentina condor. They're a little bit different. The condors are kind of well known for their yellows. A great display of reds. Look at that, 30 bucks. I could literally not polish that for $30. And Mr. Uh, this gentleman here is actually doing all the cutting himself. He's doing the polishing himself. He should put out a DVD on how to cut these. <laughs> Here's a nice pseudomorph. I love it. There's a few folks that are, are getting really good in the industry. Um, the gentleman from Agates from Mexico or Mexican Agates, one of those two, I don't remember his name. He's getting really good. Um, obviously Eugene Mueller's really good. He's a bull wheel user as well. So honestly folks, I'm not gonna lie. You can get a pretty good polish with a Genie or a Cab King, but for Agates, it's silicon carbide. It's part of partly the speed, partly that the silicon carbide breaks down and creates finer meshes. I beg your pardon, sir. Can I trouble you? Can you can you show me your favorite piece that you have? They're all your babies, but maybe one that you particularly love right now. What about this? Stunning. Is this um, condor or a crater? Condor. Oh, wow. And sometimes it'll have amethyst inside? Sometimes, but it's rare. It's rare. So I see you're not afraid to cut Lagunas. No problem with Mexican materials. No, I didn't cut those. Is this from the young man who owns the mine, his family? How do I pronounce it? It begins with an A? I don't remember the last name. He's, get, he's getting really good. He's getting really good. He, uh, he uses a similar technique. I think he's, obviously it's a bull, though. Okay. You can tell. Yeah. Where is he? I heard he, um, he didn't do a venue. He did a, he rented a house, Airbnb. Uh -huh. And supposedly online, I think he's here somewhere at the TCC. Yeah, I've, I've but I haven't found him yet. Yeah. Yeah, those are our like yellow, orange, honey colored. Mm. Yeah, really. Amazing. How long have you been in Agates? Since I was six. Really? Were you just finding them or were you working them back in the day too? No, I was collecting them when we went with my parents on a vacation trip. Um, Every time I found free, Agates, I was collecting mostly junk, of course. So that's how it started. It's a hobby. Now it's a passion. <laughs> Always was a passion, but now it's a business. Yeah. Besides hobby. Check this one. Make it to Miner's Kingdom, please. Fantastic material. I think when people think of Argentina, they think of the rotocrosite coming from Minas Capillitas. But um, I think of Condor, honestly. It's just a cutter's material. Like, look at that. You know, are most of our cabs even half that good? Not really. <clears throat> and, um, you know, you can vibro lap these. You're not going to get the quality that this gentleman's getting. You can um, take these to traditional machines. And some of you folks might be getting really close or even matching it, like with your diamond paste or your cerium on your machines. But it's also the speed. Could this gentleman afford to um, <clears throat> take the amount of time that it would take on a traditional machine, especially if he's producing it himself? Maybe not. These are, it's just, it's, I'm so nerd out over him and Mrs. Telesantos' material. 
and it's very affordable. Oh, I forgot to mention Condor Agate Mines, booth 326 through 328. Here's a great book match. You'd want to buy both of those together. Like you can see someone's fingerprint right on right here, on this. Like I said earlier, the only imperfection in these is people's finger grease and the dust. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention please? We have the winning numbers for our two o'clock drawing. Please take out your yellow ticket that you received at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society giveaway booth located at the west end of the exhibition hall. Remember, this is not your paid admission ticket. The winning numbers for this hour are the last three digits, six, Seven zero. Once again, that's six seven zero. The next ticket, the last three numbers are six zero five. That's six zero five. And our last ticket for this hour, the last three digits are six five three. Six five three. The next drawing will be at three o'clock. Come to the TGMS giveaway booth located under the pink giveaway sign next to the Tucson Gem and Mineral Society information booth to pick up a free new ticket for the next drawing. You may also enter for our grand prize drawing for the tanzanite and Pariva tourmaline and gold pendant necklace courtesy of CRM who is located at booth 311 to 313 in the exhibition hall. We would like to thank the following dealers for their generous donations. Mineral Miner, located at booth 320, and the Crystal Circle, located at booth 619, and Too Few and Too Precious, located at 1426. Thank you. If you don't mind me asking, sir, is contamination something um, that you have to worry about with your bull wheel in the in your process using silicon carbide? Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, because it's a high speed sender. <laughs> so the high speed keeps any debris, the centrifuge force, expel any debris. Oh, just whipping it right off. Yeah. Oh, wow. Otherwise, the contamination will be heavy. Definitely. And uh, when I talk about you to people, it's my assumption that you can have such good prices for some of these because of how fast you're cutting them. If you were on a calving machine taking three hours, you know, something that would be 50 would have to be 200, 300 dollars. And... Well, uh, yes, some, some of the price have to do with the time spending on cutting and polishing, but most of the price have to do with the abundance of material mm. so like this crater is the, the, the field the deposit is so big that that allows you to sell it for less price than any other deposit that is a small arco iris deposit is very small first and second they need heavy machinery to mine this that's another overhead, high overhead. I see this material sometimes go for over $200 a pound, sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, that's probably a reflection of the excavators and, the, and all of that. It's like if it wasn't enough to just own the land, now you gotta, hey, that's the beginning. <laughs> Maybe machinery have a lot to do with the final price. Do you think there's still some amazing agates in Argentina yet to be found? Oh yeah, of course, condor. New deposits of condor. I found new deposits once in a while. 
It must be hard rock mining, huh? No. It's all on I the surface? I need heavy machinery for this. Oh, wow. It's just pick and shovel. Mostly no deeper than two feet. Oh, wow. On loose, decomposed rock. Luis de los Santos, make sure to come check them out. Booth 326 through 328 until Sunday. The guy's a beast. He's a bull wheel machine. Check him out. Here's some cool Lagunas for a buck. I'm gonna have to buy some of these. They're too cheap not to. I have a Richardson Ranch. I'll probably have to give this technique a shot, but I think the worn out wheel is a huge component to the technique. It's like, it's so much easier said than done the way this gentleman likes to polish. camera down picks them out I'm mostly just looking to avoid um, looking to avoid quartz I'm not a big fan of the quartz in my nodules the quartz even more than the fractures to be honest those five for five bucks what a deal I really need to be practicing well my Richardson.
right, we're gonna take a look at Rocks and Spheres with Bev Darby, booth 608 through 612, uh, Rocks and Fears from Prescott, Arizona. Really high quality stuff. She's doing all the sphering by herself and she's not using a core drill, which is extra impressive. Really high quality. Love Moss sits it. Metamorphic rock from Burma, known as Myanmar in the foothills of the Himalayas. It can consist of a combination of that stuff, <laughs> that other stuff, chromite, albite, chromane, and that stuff with the knee. It is thought to be energizing. Definitely great stuff. She's getting a really good polish. Definitely above uh, the standard that you might see coming from some mass produce wholesalers. She's also making these marbles. Um, this takes specialty equipment. You can't do those on a lot of traditional sphering machines. And um, these are great. A lot of these that you see are com that are coming from mass produced cutters are actually using similar equipment to making beads. I bet you she's not using a bead mill. She's probably using some kind of smaller sphering machine. Smaller sphere, machines intended for smaller spheres were manufactured back in the day, not so much anymore. This is great stuff. Uh, this one's super high quality. And this one's a little bit more of the casual qualities, but um, it looks really good in spheres form. In my opinion, sphering is a really great way to show off some materials. And uh, they also have more than just spheres, which is why they're called rock and spheres. Here's some of the rocks. Some of the cats. Wonder are these cut in the Congo? You cannot have enough Malachite cats. You guys hear me joke a lot about uh, soapstone cats and stuff, but I think they look great. The more you have on a table, the better they look together. Magnesite and Jade. I actually took a look at some of this material from our good friend at Quartzite. Really cool stuff. Sometimes you'll see people plating this metal here. If you guys watch my Village Silversmith video of the jade with the 24 karat gold, they were um, plating the hematite on here. I think that would look really cool in sphere form. I definitely wouldn't want to have too many of them and have to explain to people that it's not naturally gold. Um, I think it looks really good as the natural hematite, but um, I thought two of the gold ones would be cool. That's from Victorville, California. That's near where um, Sweet Jim and Diamond Dave Duncan live. Great rock club in Victorville. Here's a beautiful piece of Russian material. Is it tourmaline? Here's some Peter Sight spheres. Now, cabbing, you can lose 30 to 50% of the material or more. Um, faceting, you can lose 70% of the stone. Sphering is no different. You are losing a lot of material to sphere a stone. A material like Coverlight that's already super valuable, really expensive, you're losing a lot of yield from the stone to create a sphere, but it makes it that much more special. This piece is $3,800. That is a good price for this fantastic material. Handmade by Bev. Um, I imagine, Bev, Bev, if you don't mind me asking, this material is very expensive. Yes. You're not just throwing away the offcuts when you're done with that. No, see. <laughs> oh, you made the cabochons. My husband does the cabs. Wow, he's a great cutter, nice designer shapes. I can tell just from looking at them, they all have perfect girdles intended to be put into jewelry. They're not just specimen cabs. Designer pieces for sure. How long have you been spearing, spearing Bev? I have been spearing for, I have to think how old he is. Oh my gosh. I, mean, um, I have been making spheres since 
been about 27 years. Oh, you're great at it. Above average is quality for sure. Thank you. If you don't mind me bugging, I know you're really busy. These don't... They're not mine. Oh, okay. I was going to ask because... Um... They don't have my name on them. Oh, nice. Like but um, it takes a special sphering machine to do the, the marbles. It's a marble roller. So yeah, it's, so it's probably similar to the machinery that you would use for milling beads, just on yes. a bigger level. Yes. Well, yours are better. Well. <laughs> yours are the best. You know, but not everyone can afford that price. So. Oh, right. You're keeping it real for everyone. You have really great taste, Bev. Thank you. Here's a beautiful piece of Chrysocolla from Baghdad, Arizona. Steve upstairs was showing us some of the rough. It was stabilized. Uh, this doesn't look stabilized. Lots of silica in there, keeping it all together. Beautiful shell. Beautiful rotocrosite bowl to put your other rotocrosite pieces in the bowl. Boom. <laughs> It's a really nice business. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Your attention, please. We have an illegally parked beautiful Tiffany stone in the B lot that won't be yeah. towed if the owner does not move it. Arizona license plate eight Z as in zebra, A as in alpha, four W A. Please move your van immediately or it will be towed. A Honda van in the B lot. There was a license plate 8Z A4W A. Thank you. I'm sorry, Beth. These are stunning. I imagine you must have done these ones yourself for sure. Yes. The tips. Oh, wow. That is stunning. Oh yeah. Do you think so the fluorescence? Do you think the green spots is the is the calcedony in there? Um, it probably has a little bit of reactivity that makes it go green. Oh, fantastic! Although my Geiger counter at home does not pick it up. Oh wow! Where'd you get a Geiger counter? Ordered it online. <laughs> oh, fantastic! And we were talking about the yttrium. You were hunting for some high quality yttrium. Wasn't able to find it this year. And you're not going to settle for the no. for the pale stuff. It takes me too long to make this fence to go for lower quality yeah. Fantastic. Did you do the Sonoran? Yes. Amazing. Not the, not the slabs, but the spirits I did. Great um, contrast between the green and the blue and the blue and the, and the red. A lot of times when you find this material, it'll just be mostly red, like this one, maybe a spot of green, or mostly green and almost no red. This one's got a good blend of both. That is a killer slab there. Really great work. Beautiful flowers. My good friend Michael Torino has a metal pipe slice mm -hmm. that malachite was growing inside of it mm -hmm. in the similar floral pattern all around the metal pipe. And so it, it, I guess it can form pretty fast within yeah. the last hundred years, That's, you know. Um, I had another friend brought me um, something they bought here at, the, at one of these shows that was a metal pipe. Was it a slice? Yeah. I think I've seen them and before. It had something inside of it that was just like that. Oh, it was like a stalactite. It was a ragonite. Oh, yeah. That formed from the, uh, some sort of uh, hot springs. Oh, in wow. In Germany or something. There was a hot springs that ran the water through, and it would uh, build stalactites inside the pipes. Oh, man. Yeah. Was the slice an arm and a leg? I don't know. I didn't it's good to see you, bro. Always good to see you, my friend. Come by the miners again. I'll be there, I hope. Heck, yeah. I need to get some of that Paul Bunyan. <laughs> that sandstone sphere is really cool. A 
and some parrot wings. Now there's a variation coming from Mexico. This one's the Mexican one. And then there's a variation from Arizona. This material is very collectible, absolutely beautiful. One of the chrysocolas that I've cut in the past that does not need to be stabilized. Um, some of the Arizona stuff can, I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff out there from Mexico that has to be, but uh, this stuff is very, very stable. Looks great. I sell cabs of this material for well over $100 sometimes. I have a few pieces left to me from Sweet Jim. I was giving away a lot of Sweet Jim material. I don't think I'm gonna be doing that anymore. Uh, the stuff that he gave me before he passed. Amazing, look at this beautiful piece of plume. Graveyard point from the Pink Lady Mine or near there, known for their opals. Some beautiful metals in there. Is that pyrite? Is that what they call marcasite? I've never seen a, a graveyard point plume sphere before. Bev's got great taste. Some purple saginite. Is it amethyst? Some hematite with chrysocolla. Really great looking stuff. Some desert storm dolomite. I should buy a slab of this for my good friend Dave Duncan. He's really into the natural earth tones and picture jaspers. I'll tell you the truth, I really did not like earth tone stones. I'm like, there's so many other colorful, pretty things to look at. Wasn't into it. He showed me the, the Royal Sahara stuff, and I got to see some high quality old bigs and absolutely fell head over heels for earth tone stones. And uh, obviously this material is taking a really good polish. Looks like it undercut a bit because of the difference in variation and of hardness in the material. But um, looks great and it has that Kevin Kessler orange oil smell to it. I know where they're getting their saw oil from. This is some penalite. Is this the Canadian? No, this is the Austrian variation. Beautiful stuff. I do believe that um, this material is soft. Softer rather than some others. Let's go over here. Cryptic Passion Jasper. Here's some Atlantisite here. I prefer the purple stitch tight over the serpentine Atlantisite, but this is a really nice one. Some nice Rosetta stone. Um, looks like it might be gone, unless this is it. It can't be, this is that same material there. Ah, maybe this is it, and it just didn't have any more room down here. This is definitely the same material. Beautiful lace agate. So I'm super excited to see this and those, but we'll start with this. So this is silver lace onyx. This is from Barstow, California. This material is near and dear to my heart from Don Dupree and their rock yard at the Diamond Pacific factory where everything is $3 a pound. Um, this is just like, reminds me of all my time in Southern California spending with Sweet Jim and Sandy, Dave Duncan and Don Dupree. Hey, thanks for watching, man. I appreciate it. He paid you out and it made her gasp. Oh no, come on. You guys are too nice. Oh, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Have you guys been at the show long? Oh yeah. No, you've been here almost three weeks. Oh my. Who's counting? Yeah. The woman the snow Oh my goodness. Well, no, no, no rush back to the to the cold. 
Oh, that, this is the same it's like again. This material is really cool. Sometimes you get some bugs in there. It's kind of hard to see. It looks like she's using really choice pieces. I wonder if she got this from the rock yard. That's probably the most affordable place to get. It's $3 a pound. Um, Diamond Pacific used to manufacture sphering machines. They actually used to manufacture a lathe for making um, vases or whatever you want to make. And they made a sphering machine for making spheres, obviously. I don't believe they manufacture those anymore. I am looking hard for one of the old Diamond Pacific lathes. Uh, you go through a lot of material. Um, the Diamond Pacific boys over there, they're extremely honest about what they do and do not like. Mr. Dupree told me that he wasn't particularly satisfied with that lathe, which is perhaps why they're no longer manufacturing it. If I'm wrong, Don, you let me know. I believe that's what I remember of the story. And um, instead of using like hand chisels and stuff for the lathe it used a diamond blade pretty genius probably wouldn't be too hard to fabricate at home if you have the uh the nerve and the know-how this is really cool how light a material that a lot of people kind of ignore because of its unfortunate use as the um host for the dyes of fake turquoise but I, I love this material. It has, not, I have nothing but love for this material. What about Halite, folks? What about Halite? This is its natural form. Totally stunning. Very affordable material. Again, she's using high-end versions of the material. It's not a crack, that's a natural vug. Somebody who wants to sell spheres in their shop, you can come over here and buy everything and resell. You can get two or three times your money back. Very affordable prices that Miss Beth has here. Here's some more of the Baghdad material. I imagine this stuff is quite pricey. Yeah, this sphere is 21. Um, that makes sense for the sphere, but imagine what this piece here, if that's Baghdad, it's got to be really expensive. However, Arizona material, it's an American material. If you know somebody, somebody's like, yeah, I got a bunch of it in my backyard from when we were working at the copper mine. Go ahead and help yourself out. That stuff happens all the time. Um, looks like it is stabilized. The chrysocol, much like turquoise, I'd rather work to a stabilized chrysocol that's going to be able to be hold together when you work it than a non-stabilized piece that um, is going to crumble on me. I wonder who's living in there. Super kind of Miss Bev to let us take a look at all of her goods. If you folks come to the TCC show, the Tucson Gym and Mineral main event, make sure to check her out. Again, booth 608 through 612, pretty much near the stairs right when you come in here. Really cool stuff. Um, and they're working the offcuts from the spheres. So nothing's going to waste. Arizona Peter side. I've never heard of it before. Is Peter Sight, you know, most people associate it with the blue. I imagine it's probably something else that's Chatoyant in there that is the, actually the Peter Sight. I could be wrong. Super unique. Really cool polished tile specimens.
Absolutely incredible. These chloride included crystals, extremely pointy. This one even has some root tile in there. Booth 423. Come check them out. Really awesome. Super kind folks. Oh, that's the, that's Harry. Yeah. Yeah. Are you selling the books? Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, there's $15. Yeah. He's, he's the first miner in Nepal. Yeah. Fantastic. You know, you hear about the Himalayan material a lot, but I guess I never hear specifically Nepal, you know, for minerals. It's yeah, really we cool. We have many minerals, but there are many are uh, undiscovered. Yeah. It must be very exciting. Yes. And also, this is very high altitude, and it's hard to, you know, mine. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Imagine just getting up there, let alone working all day and bringing it down. Yes. Do you happen to have a pen? If I bought it, I'd like Harry to sign it for me. I guess you Yeah, you come back. Yeah, he's uh, Perfect. Yeah. Which one is your favorite out of all of them? There's so many. Yeah, it's hard to yeah, decide. It's hard to say. Yeah, this is like, those are amazing. Those are the collector piece, you know? This, how you, this is all, and even here, a small piece. This here is more unique. Right? Look at this one. Oh, wow, so delicate. Yeah, this is so delicate. And this is not man-made. And those all are so, you know, collector piece. Like, like this piece, like a key. Look at, like a cross, you know? And so, so many things people like to buy and then a collector piece and save it like this, you know? There's, there were so many different things. And yeah. Fantastic. Yes. Yeah. Those things are more collecting and then the you know, yes. This from the farm? Yeah, this is from the farm. Uh, this is uh three thousand one hundred. Three thousand one hundred. Yes. This is very old you know. This was mined in 1970. This is, yeah. Wow. Beautiful Japan law from Nepal. I wonder if it was mined by Harry. That's a nice big crystal over there. A real nice one over here, but this right here is something special. The gentleman who was standing next to me said that this is the world's best rose quartz crystal. Most people have never even seen a rose quartz crystal, like a real terminated piece of rose quartz. Everyone's like, oh, I got, I got a bunch of them for $12 at Kino. No, those are shaped into the shape of a crystal. Most people have never seen a crystallized rose quartz. This is from Pakistan. No, it's from Afghanistan. I 
absolutely amazing. I've been seeing small pieces of this material from Brazil. Sorry, my friend. Go for about $125 a first, very small piece. Um, there's a gentleman selling a flat at Motel 6 for $360 of small pieces, just under a half of a kilo. I wonder what the world's best is going for. Totally amazing. I'm so happy that the gentleman pointed it out. I would have thought that it was from a crow side or something different. Oh, see my camera does not. Do this any justice. So much cooler than that Picasso necklace that was here years ago. Lots of great stuff over here. Look at that beautiful Herkimer. Next to its cousin, the Pacamer. <laughs> and that's a beautiful piece of quartz from Switzerland. I don't know almost anything about Switzerland material. Pakistan, I'm talking. Where you have to get? <coughs> Tourmalines from all around the world. Tanzania, Afghanistan, Brazil, Congo, Nepal. I heard a lot of this was mined in the 70s. California, where? Oh, from Paula, the Paula Chief mine, of course. That big one in the back over there, that's also from Paula. Probably came out of the mine a long time ago. Steve the Miner could probably tell you. Make sure to go look for Steve the Miner when you folks are down at the Paula Chief. How you doing, brother? Subscriber. Oh, thanks for yeah, watching. I just want, I wondered if I'd run into you. I'm so glad to meet you.